Good afternoon. Good afternoon, welcome. It is my distinct honor to welcome Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Heath Jones. Welcome Rear Admiral Wayne Ardwin. Welcome Admiral Linda Fagan, Commandant, United States Coast Guard. Thank you for joining us today. Jones, his wife, and did I miss her? She is working. Well, hopefully she'll see this on YouTube and know that we welcome her here. <clears throat> Master Chief Jones assumed the duties of the 14th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard on May 19, 2022. Master Chief, Chief Jones is the senior enlisted member of the Coast Guard and the principal advisor to the Commandant on all enlisted personnel matters. <clears throat> Master Chief Jones is a native of Covington, Louisiana. He enlisted in the Coast Guard in August of 1995. His previous assignments include Command Master Chief, Deputy Commandant for Mission Support, Command Master Chief, Pacific Area, Command Master Chief, 8th Coast Guard District, Command Master Chief, and Sector Hampton Roads Officer in Charge. He holds both a Bachelor and a Master of Arts degree in Organizational Management with a specialty in Human Resource Management. Master Chief Jones, we look forward to your comments. Oh, am I speaking? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, want me, you want me to flip this now? Okay. So, so what we're going to do, well, first of all, thank you all very much. It's great to be here in St. Louis with you. Um, we, we, when Admiral Fagan and I came in, we kind of do things a little different than, than previous teams have done. We like to go where she goes first, and then I come in and kind of back clean up. She'll come up here and say that what I'll do is she'll say things, and I'll go, what the Admiral meant was this. So <laughs> if I could, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our 27th Commandant, Admiral Linda Fagan. <laughs> And this way, we get to avoid the reading of my bio. You know where to find it online. It's all over the place. All you need to know is we're here now, and I am really, really excited to spend, uh, both Master Chief and I are excited to spend a little bit of time with you this afternoon. Uh, I was reflecting before uh, coming down from my room that it was August in Orlando was the last time that I had an opportunity to engage uh, with a large uh, group nationally of auxiliarists. And, uh, you know, in August, three months into the job, I will admit things were a bit of a blur. Um, it's still a bit of a blur 10 months into the job, but uh, I've gained some uh, perspective and sort of uh, thoughts on how uh, we are uh, moving our Coast Guard forward, how we are collectively leading our Coast Guard forward. And I thought what I would do, this is, I'm going to do a little bit of a different format, not kind of the standard uh, all hands type approach that I would use uh, with a group of uh, you know frontline coasties. I'm not going to give a formal uh, speech, but I, what I want to kind of start with some big picture uh, thematics reflections uh, with regard to the international uh, demand and engagement for the Coast Guard. Talk about it in a global context, and then bring it in more uh, more closely to the work the workforce work, uh, the Coast Guard strategy in some of the uh, critical you know, maritime uh, work that each of you are engaged in uh, each and every day. I'll turn it over to Master Chief. He'll, he'll play cleanup for anything that I misspeak on. And, uh, and then I, we would like to hear from you what's on your minds, uh, things that um, you know, we have not talked about collectively as a group. And I 
um, Marvel, a couple of you in the room have heard me also reflect on this. As a, uh, as a young cadet, I was just at the Coast Guard Academy over the weekend, uh, I can remember wandering around on the weekend that the D1 guys do their D train, and I was like, who are these people? I, like, what is the silver? I, like, I'm really confused. And, you know, I go off into uh, my Coast Guard career, and it was some time then before I had any regular engagement with the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary. I was a, you know, kind of mid-grade and more senior officer. Um, but I reflect on the journey that we've been on together, and truly only limited by our imagination with regard to the work and the contribution that the Auxiliary can and will do uh, for us in the future. And I'll, I'll talk to, to some of that just critical work that's ongoing, uh, ongoing now. So uh, they have not given me my air mile total. I think they think it may depress me. We were at 150,000 miles as we came into the new year, and uh, you know we're three months past that. I'm not sure what it looks like. I've flown around the world uh, quite literally and figuratively uh, more than once, but had a number of key opportunities for international engagements. So we were in England two months ago. I was having, I get to say this, I was having tea with the first Sea Lord cool things you get to do as the Commandant. <laughs> Although, you know, the term First Sea Lord, that's pretty cool. I don't know, Commandant seems a little boring in comparison, but... Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, apparently the head of the Canadian Navy is, goes by the term Kraken. That's another cool term, to be the <laughs> Kraken. But, so I'm si we're sitting there and we're talking about uh, areas of overlap and short, shared interest. So this, you know, the First Sea Lord is the head of the Royal British Navy, and I have always thought of the Royal British Navy as very much uh, a peer of our U.S. navies, and it became apparent, though, as we were talking, that the vast majority of his portfolio of work was actually Coast Guard work, maritime governance work, sovereignty work, creating presence, the kinds of effect that we create as a, as a Coast Guard. Um, short time after that, the Deputy Prime Minister for Australia was visiting, visiting the United States, and uh, the only um, sort of military service that he asked to meet with, Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, so the number two person there, uh, was the U.S. Coast Guard. So I hosted him at Coast Guard headquarters, and then our leadership in the department, uh, the Deputy Secretary said, is that normal? Is it normal to host the deputy? I'm like, nope, nope, pretty sure we haven't done that before, but, you know, here, here we are. But it speaks, again, to recognition on the part of the Australians as they are engaging in leadership around uh, the Indo-Pacific, on the value proposition of the Coast Guard, of our authorities, of the remit, the professionalism, the capabilities that, that you all uh, see firsthand as you're out uh, working, uh, working with our, our units. But so fun side story though, so the Deputy Prime Minister leaves Coast Guard headquarters, goes over to the Pentagon, and proceeds to rave to the Secretary of Defense about how great the U.S. Coast Guard is. <laughs> and, it got so bad, the Secretary of Defense had to say, you do know they don't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so this global recognition and global demand on the Coast Guard, and it's, you know, it has been there, but it is, it is now uh, being recognized in areas truly around the world, and whether uh, it's work we're doing in the Indo-Pacific, uh, work in Africa. I just got back from Cabo Verde meeting uh, with 25 African nations, heads of navies, heads of Coast Guard, on and talking about maritime security, talking about uh, ensuring uh, and guarding against illegal fishing, creating presence in your own exclusive economic zones, creating maritime domain awareness, and we are the partner of choice in that in that conversation. Uh, some people say, well, is that, you know, is that where we should be? It's absolutely where we should be, and there is a lot of opportunity in the, in the recognition. As I engage with our overseers in Washington, one of the other things that has changed, and you know, when and where exactly it changed, I don't know, but the value proposition, the return on investment, and the business case that is the U.S. Coast Guard I don't have to walk in the room and make a business case for the organization. It's assumed. And that didn't always used to be the case, and there's opportunity in that as we look forward beyond the investments that we're doing and all of the, the major operating capability to the kinds of infrastructure investments we need to make and the people investments. I'll talk a little bit about um, people and I think recruiting and where we are, I know, is on uh, many, many of your um, minds. 
So the value proposition that we bring around the world is, you know, as a maritime constabulary, as a law enforcement agency, we bring the rule of law, we bring good governance, but more important than that, we bring values and leadership that are recognized by our peers and in smaller uh, countries around, around the world as, you know, wanting us to be a, a partner, partner of choice. So let me kind of step back in a little little closer to home and kind of the, the journey that we've been on uh, from June until now. Uh, you'll know, you'll have seen the Commandant strategy, the three tenants, I have no intention of um, unpacking all of that here. Happy to take questions if you got any specifics. That was followed by a Coast Guard strategy that was put out this fall, it was about November timeframe. A couple things about the Coast Guard strategy that uh, are worth highlighting. It's not date bounded and it's not a commandant strategy. The principles in the Coast Guard strategy are meant to sort of endure to the extent that they are useful for current leadership and future leadership to, to guide and steer the organization uh, forward. My ask when I meet with active duty people, I'll ask the same, uh, same here. I'm not gonna ask you if you've read it, but I would ask that you look at it and find something in it that excites you, that you can help us bring it bring it forward and make it make it better. And you'll note when I started, I talked about our global Coast Guard. And so this is our Coast Guard and you are absolutely key and integrated members of this team as we uh, bring the organization forward forward into the, into the future. At the State of the Coast Guard, which was, I guess it was about a month ago, also available online, it's about a 23 minute speech, not too long, a lot of positive, uh, feedback, thank you for keeping it short, thank you for keeping it on the hill, and oh, by the way, as a speaker, if you're worried about, you know, delivery and performance, liquor the audience up before the speech, it was great. <laughs> so in the State of the Coast Guard, I, I talked about and began to signal that we are building towards a $20 billion a year organization now. We're about 12.5 but uh, we are on budget for a number of key investments that will take us over the course of the next you know, five, eight years towards $20 billion, and, we'll, and I will continue to advocate for that on the, on the Hill. We talked about the need for a consistent, recurring, you know, two to $3 billion in infrastructure investments, the kinds of things. If you've been to a small Coast Guard unit in, in New England, in places where we're not prone to hurricane damage, you know uh, where, where the infrastructure uh, investments uh, need to be made and we need to continue uh, to get after that so that, so that the young men and women that are out there operating on the front lines have the best equipment uh, available and that includes buildings and piers and, and infrastructure. So we have made a lot of progress. The first 100 days there were a number of key initiatives that, uh, that were, were, we got over the uh, threshold. Some things though that you may, may not have uh, come across that are having big impacts on the organization. Things like Agile A School. So if you've heard me talk about the workforce, we right now run a talent management system that is an up or out system. Officer enlisted, you come in at the bottom, you step onto a conveyor belt and you move forward. The system is optimized towards that. It's optimized towards 18 year olds at both of those accession points that you step on, that you're gonna fully train and provide uh, experience and professional development and grow them forward. Master Chief and I were in Cape May just a couple weeks ago and we, were, we graduated a boot camp company. I'd say two thirds of that company were not 18 year olds fresh out of high school, yet that's how the system is primed. They, they come to us with all kinds of life experiences, certified uh, paramedics, uh, credentialed cooks, uh, aircraft mechanics, and so when we talk about Agile A School, it's acknowledging some of that skill and expertise that is coming to us even at that at bottom line entry point and accelerating uh, the getting, uh, getting the person through whatever little top up they need to make sure they understand how we do that work. In the Coast Guard, we've, uh, a number of corpsmen have been accelerated through Agile A School number of cooks and we're looking at what other rates we can, uh, we can accelerate that into. A lateral entry, another way for folks to you know, lateral into the organization at the E5 a level. Easing the influx of talent is one of the key things that we're getting after, uh, particularly as we talk about recruiting and I'll, I'll talk to that here, here in a minute. Um, 
We have uh, done a lot of work, uh, again, just around the talent management system and tools, and we're making uh, making investments. We've invested in recruiting capacity. There were a couple, where's the, there's some recruiters in here. There's a dog with them. Where are the recruiters? See, this is, we're handing out stickers and we're bringing puppies. This is the, this is the new, yeah. The puppies always draw people uh, draw people in, but we are uh, we're, we are making some very targeted and intentional investments in recruiting capacity, and uh, you know certainly this is an area that's prime. And I know we've got many auxiliaries helping us with the academy uh, introduction mission, with AIM and other things. But there is opportunity uh, here for you to directly support some of those recruiting initiatives and uh, and efforts. So the the other thing that we're doing. So, we, uh, we need to do a better job at marketing the organization. People don't know who we are, depending on where they live. It's, all, it's always amazing when somebody will come up to me and say, oh, the Coast Guard, yeah, you know, they'll usually know the search and rescue thing, or if, like if somebody's fallen off a cruise ship and we've rescued them, they'll have that, but they don't really understand the totality of what we do as an organization. And um, if you've been around us, and some of you have for a while, you know the ill-fated NASCAR advertising followed by the WWF advertising. Not exactly the demographic. That, is that how we got you? Got me, <laughs> Questions I should have asked, but. Um, uh, so we're, but we're getting much more sophisticated in how we are using our, um, certainly our advertising money. I get a lot of credit with the millennial audience when I say this next thing, Twitch. It's an online gaming platform. We are in that platform looking uh, for talent. In other words, we're going to young people where they are in the, uh, in the electronic and social media domain in a way that's not just these big, big blast uh, national uh, advertising campaigns. Right? There's a reason why we're not advertising in AARP, not the target audience, right? <laughs> All right, so hey, let me talk a little bit about some of what we're doing uh, operationally and now really uh, share with you some of the great work uh, that, that each of the um, units and flotillas that, that you are overseeing and engaged in and how you've contributed directly uh, to, to the success of the Coast Guard over, over the past, past year. Um, we, I'm going to leave the migrant work for, for some of the southwest border migration work sort of towards the end because that is, that is work that has been uh, consuming uh, for us and has also had a very significant uh, volunteer rate amongst the auxiliaries that have really been uh, significant and helpful as we support both the department on the land border uh, but our frontline units, particularly in D7 in the, in the Florida Straits and the, in the Caribbean. So, you know, Gus is in the seat. Congratulations, Mary. Congratulations. They get, Gus gets to sit. I don't know, he may wonder when he comes sits to the leadership meetings and headquarters, like, this is what they do at headquarters? <laughs> you know, and we pay him so much to come to these meetings, so. <laughs> we feed him well, but that's about the only thing I <laughs> Uh, but so I know one of the things that uh, the Gus and the leadership team have embarked on is a, is a talent management gap analysis. And so again, as I reflect on the journey, we'll talk about some of the areas that auxiliary is contributing now that, that were not in place five, eight, ten years ago. There is opportunity there. And I, I will say this again, we are only limited by our imagination in what and where we create that, that opportunity for the expertise and the talent that's reflected here and reflected out in your, in your flotillas. So uh, cyber. Right. We've stood up two cyber protection teams. We're standing up one on the West Coast. They you know, announced this, talked about it in the state of the Coast Guard. We have AUX volunteers integrated in the cyber protection teams. I mean, cyber wasn't something we were even talking about uh, in it with any significance five, eight years ago. And here we are with teams fully formed, stood up, operationalized, and auxiliary members uh, integrated with their expertise helping, uh, helping those, those teams. Um, RBS, right, we've had recreational boating safety for a long time. We all know the COVID impacts. A lot of people bought boats that they didn't actually know how to, how to operate. And, uh, you know, 48,000 vessel checks, over 1,100 cases with 239 lives saved, attributed directly to auxiliary uh, volunteers, lives that might, not have, that might have been lost but for uh, the collective efforts of, uh, of this group. 
So let's talk a little bit, I mean, and then I get pay time, right? The, the aids to navigation verification have uh, absolutely been critical, particularly in areas, you know, in, in New England, Long Island Sound, areas where we've just got a lot of aids to navigation and having uh, the auxiliary work to verify that pay time has been, uh, been absolutely uh, critical. So let me talk a little bit about, uh, about migration. First, uh, in the context of the Southwest border and the land border, the department had uh, asked the Coast Guard for uh, sort of general duty people, which we uh, don't really have. We have specialists, right? We've got boat drivers and you've got corpsmen and you've got people with skills, some of which may be helpful and we did deploy to the border, but they were really looking and anxious for support. And we had 250 auxiliaries uh, answer the call to serve at the southwest border in, you know, in places like El Paso. In fact, we have 10 auxiliaries in El Paso right now uh, serving the department, serving the nation in the, in the migration uh, realm. So OVS, Operation Vigilant Sentry, is the, the water uh, side of the, uh, the migration challenge that, uh, that, that we face as a country and that we're engaged in as an, as an organization. And um, the you know, auxiliary has been there in force for us as well in that, uh, in that mission space. It's, it's life-saving work. It's critical life-saving work. Uh, the numbers as we came into the first of the year and the flows, primarily Cubans and Haitians, were, were very, very challenging for the crews. It was a, it was a very difficult uh, time for uh, our units, but, uh, you know, the auxiliaries, you were, you were out there, and whether it was aux chefs helping, uh, helping in the galleys or aux chaplains or interpreters, and I'll talk here in a minute about how much chaplain and interpreter capacity has been uh, contributed uh, contributed this year, but truly remarkable. In fact, on the airplane coming this morning, I signed two more ox chaplain certificates. So I think we're at we're somewhere between 103 and 105. I told Chaplain Walcott, who was the chaplain for the Coast Guard, and he retired last summer. That, well, there we here we are, right here. Here he is, <laughs> ox chaplain number 100, right here. I told him he's, he, we, we got to make sure that he is in before we get to. I almost didn't let him retire until we got to 100, but I feel like we it could balance the. All right, he's rocking the beard. I don't even recognize him with the beard. <laughs> so on the, um, just a couple of additional uh, data points, and I'm going to turn it over, uh, turn it over to Matt, Master Chief. So I was on Coast Guard Cutter Healy. This is a little more than a year ago. She circumnavigated, it went from Seattle through the Northwest Passage, was in Baltimore. Two aux chefs had been on there, and they, they had been on there. The whole, it was like they were going on 160 or 170 days on board cooking and providing for that uh, crew. I was on Eagle Saturday with a, a representative from uh, Washington State and go sort of, I'm like, hey, let me show you where the galley is and see what they do to feed, you know, 800 meals a day on this ship. And there's an ox chef standing in there. In fact, he had helped me with my ceremony when I was promoted to one star. And I, I can't tell you how many times that happens as I'm out visiting units and I walk into a, a comm center or I walk onto a galley or you walk around the corner and there's an auxiliary and that uh, it just speaks to the dedication of each uh, each and every every one of you um, on the uh, aux chef right 423 current uh, aux culinary assistants provided over 43,000 hours to galleys around around the Coast Guard the linguist the auxiliary linguist 350 active auxiliary linguist representing 54 languages and uh, 7,000 hours of mission support. I mean, really, really remarkable uh, work and talent and expertise that is, you know, directly focused into work that is needed to be supported for, for the Coast Guard. And then the aux chaplains, over 16,000 hours of service, uh, over 1,600 unit visits, and nearly 2,700 uh, televisits. And you know, as I talked about the OVS mission at sea, how difficult that work is, uh, it's particularly challenging for those crews as they come off vector and are kind of processing the work that they've done. And the aux chaplains have been, been really instrumental in staying aboard and staying with that crew and being able to uh, you know, minister to needs as those crews process the work as they return, uh, return to home part. And so really, uh, really just remarkable work. And so I want to conclude with just two thoughts. One, thank you. I can't say it enough. Thank you for everything that you are doing 
to help our Coast Guard succeed. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your professionalism. Uh, thank you for your commitment and dedication, perseverance. Uh, I can't imagine where we would be as a Coast Guard without the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and I applaud each and every one of you for, for all, that, all that you're doing. So one of the ways we're going to recognize some of this work, and we've, uh, we've not chosen the award winner yet, but we have announced the award, the Auxiliary Integration Award, and Alex and Gus and some others were instrumental in establishing the Auxiliary uh, Integration Award. It's named in honor of Commodore Bert Bertelson and Vice Admiral John Courier, a former Vice Commandant, and will be awarded to the unit who brings their active duty and auxiliary component the most uh, closely together for the bene benefit of the service. I'm really excited to be able to, uh, to recognize uh, those efforts as we, uh, we move into the future. So again, thank you. Thanks for what you're doing each and every day. I know you also have day jobs in addition to uh, all of the, the work uh, supporting the auxiliary. Uh, again, I applaud you and I thank you for all that you're doing. Semper Paratus. Everything she just said, ditto. No, <laughs> uh, no. So I'll just uh, so you see, I get the joy of following that each time, right? How fun is this, huh? Um, no, but you know. So the boss was, was was talking about you know at the very end. She said, you know, you have day jobs too. So I did want to start by apologizing my amazing wife uh, Carol, our ombudsman at large, for almost 30 years. Uh, amazing wife, amazing mom, uh, wonderful ombudsman at large, advocate, Coast Guard. Also has a day job. And she got, she's in a business call right now that she was not expecting. So she's up in the room and will hopefully be able to come down here. But I um, just want to issue that apology. No, you know, so, so the commandant sat here and, and she gave you just these, these lists of amazing things that our Coast Guard Auxiliary does. And these are the measurable things that we can count in numbers and, and, and quantify. This, this is what you can, can, can uh, contribute. And we're so grateful for that. I just kind of want to take a couple seconds and talk about from my perspective the things that you contribute to our workforce as part of our workforce that no one can really measure. And, you know, coming up enlisted in the Coast Guard, we get a little bit different view. You know, the last few years, I've obviously gotten a lot of experience at the very senior levels of the organization and senior levels of, of the auxiliary, and, and I'm grateful for that. But, uh, but coming up from day one as a junior enlisted member in this organization, you learn and you know who the Coast Guard Auxiliary is, and you get to know them very quickly. You go to our small boat stations, you go to the aids and navigation teams, you're out there and you're working with auxiliaries from day one. So we really, uh, you know, we, we really get to form that bond early on and come up together. And, uh, and just, you know, as, as we think, you know, I, was, I saw Gus when we came in the hotel and we were joking about something. He goes, hey, do you need help? We can, we can have somebody help you with this. That, that spirit among our Coast Guard auxiliary, anywhere you go, anything we ask, all we ever get is just tell us what you need. And you find a way to get that done for us. So we can't thank you enough for that. But one immeasurable thing that, that I want to make sure you know, and please share with, with your auxiliary sisters and brothers out there, is, you know, as a, um, my career, I, I came up as a bosom mate in the Coast Guard and had the opportunity to serve at several stations and several small cutters. And when I got to be the XPO and OIC of these units, um, you know, I, I know that, you know, when you're there with them, you're training them, you know what they're doing, uh, and, and you can kind of see things. But when you go home at night, you always wonder, all right, I just, I just left the keys to the kingdom with... 20 year olds, you know, and, and, and you have this. But what each of you have is life experience, and I, don't, I, I hope you know, I hope you've had those relationships coming up to know that those young men and women coming up, they look to you as more than just an auxiliary partner, as more than, as more than a Coast Guard partner. They're learning from you, they're, they're learning life skills from you. They're, you know, they're, they're sharing with you, you know, hey, I'm struggling here as a mom, as a dad, as a husband, as a wife, as, as whatever it is. You're bringing that to our workforce every, th every single day. I always found that invaluable. I know um, many, many times as, as a station OIC, you know, I'm sitting here trying to kind of figure out some tough things we're working through, and I'd go grab a couple of the auxiliarists that were retired, you know, presidents of, of industry. I'm like, hey, come on, can I, can I talk this out with you? And that's just an invaluable perspective that you provide to our workforce. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to take a second in these comments just and acknowledge that and thank you for that. 
and just, just know how much you mean to our active duty blue suitors, to our reserve blue suitors out there every day. And it's, uh, it's just it's something that, that we can never measure. Um, Chaps, it's great to see you, sir. I, I did want to hit on the, uh, well, I'm not going to hit on the Michigan thing, but uh, on, I, I did, I did, <laughs> I did uh, you know, I did want to come in, and the comment I mentioned, you know, the auxiliary chaplains, you know, as we travel, uh, everywhere we get, two specific areas that have stood out above all to me over, over the last few months, you know, in our mission down, down in D7, our mission on the maritime border, that's taken a toll on our workforce. That, that is a tough humanitarian mission. And what our auxiliary chaplains are doing down there is just immeasurable. I mean, but both in land area, pack area, these major cutters, we are, it's getting rare that we have a cutter sailing that we don't have some, for, some form of chaplain sailing with us. And this gap is definitely being filled by the auxiliary chaplains there. And the second piece, you know, the comment I was talking about, you know, our recruiting challenge. Um, I could stand up here for hours and talk about, you know, what we can all do to go out and recruit. But one thing, you know, I think it's two or three, we've had um, auxiliary doctors that have come on and helped our recruiting command clear the backlog of, of medical waivers that we're needing. Uh, now we need to get better on, on our end to maybe kind of get past the need for some of these waivers, but we had a tremendous backlog in recruiting command and Captain Tipton tells me that we've just about got that cleared and that's because of our Coast Guard auxiliary. So just uh, the words thanks just never seem to be enough coming from us. But we truly do. We thank you for everything you do. Um, I, you know, we always kind of make the joke tongue in cheek, let's double and triple your pay. I, I wish we really could. Uh, but but just, just know that everything you do every day does not go unseen, and we truly appreciate you. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to do some questions. All right, if you want to, sure. one or both of you? Both of us. Ah. If it's hard, if it's hard, Heath, you're taking it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's a great answer. There's comfort yes, in teams. There you go. So he can say things I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> we have a standing agreement that she can get me out of a whole lot more trouble than I can get her out of, so let me say the things that, that, that might go a little wrong. <laughs> Mission schedules are not a go financially at times right up to the very day they get underway. That's a great question, and I don't have the answer to it. Wayne, <laughs> take it oh, over. <laughs> you saw us both looking it's left, sir. <laughs> Troy? <laughs> Troy? So, yeah, so. All right, who's the, who's the most junior person in the room? This is going to work its way to you. Where's the most junior active duty person in the room? Just raise your hand now. Say, no, the recruiting puppy <laughs> yes. is going to help us with Recruiter's this. Recruiter's going, no, that's... No, so actually, so it's a great question. Like, obviously, I was not tracking that that's an issue. We, we need to make sure that the funding moves in ways that is responsive to your need as we execute patrols. And if, you know, uh, yeah, we'll pull the, pull the thread on that and see if we can't, uh, can't make that better. Please. FSMS. <laughs> Should we just take that head on? Oh, Do you want to? You want to? You can say things about it. I can't. <laughs> yeah. It, you it, use the four letter words. <laughs> it, we are not where we need to be with FSMS, and uh, I'm well aware of the pain points with regard to payments and orders and lag times. Uh, we are not where we need to be. Uh, the system did not uh, deliver on day one with the capacity that was advertised. We're still not where we need to be. We are uh, engaged with the most senior levels of the department with regard to inadequacies and insufficiencies in the system. I know that does not help the pain point, but know that this is a topic of daily conversation at headquarters, that we, we, we need this system to function for us, and it does not have the functionality that we need right now, and uh, we're continuing to, to work on uh, getting it into a more responsive um, system for us. All right, wonderful. Next was a recruiting uh, question. Considering the recruitment challenges experienced by all branches of the military, what can we do better to get the word out about, about who we are and what we do? You, you already reflected on this a little bit. Uh, many, we see many Coast Guard ads on social media, and there are also many on YouTube videos, but also see television recruiting ads for the Army, the Marines, and the Navy. 
what would the Coast Guard would the Coast Guard benefit from such television ads? So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of jump to this one first. Um, the, the number one thing that we're asking every Coast Guard member to do, and when I say every Coast Guard member, every Sentinel, I mean every active duty, every reserve, every auxiliarist, every civilian. We are all uh, Coast Guard Sentinels. The number one thing I ask everybody to do is to tell their story. We, I always say my, my favorite thing about, about our workforce is they are humble servants of America. And the most frustrating thing to me about our workforce is they're humble servants of America. And, and, and a lot of folks say, hey, what do you do? I'm in the Coast Guard, and you just kind of all shucks, kick the dirt, and walk away. I want them to tell our story. I'm not asking them to do Chief Perrin's job back there and get them to MEPS and get them onto a bus to Cape May. But what I am asking is it, there's, there's over 80,000 of us, active duty reserve, civilian auxiliary, there's over 80,000 of us. If each one of us just brought one person, gave one contact to a recruiter, they'd be waving the white flag. I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready to make them mad at us and say, hey, stop sending us people right now by doing that. And, <laughs> and, and, on the, uh, and, and kind of on the advertising piece, so we got a presentation back at the LC in November. Gus, you were in there with us. And they started with, has anybody in this room seen a Coast Guard commercial? And we didn't. And they said, good. Yeah. They said, if you're seeing the commercial, you're not our target audience. So it is a different way of advertising that they're, that they're getting after. I did raise the point of, you, I do still see Navy commercials, Army commercials, Air Force commercials on TV every now and then. So I have been kind of pushing back, saying, hey, let's maybe not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is something to, yeah, just, just awareness out there. So it's kind of that, that mixed thing uh, towards that advertising. All right, very good. Yeah, so, well, I don't know. Are we going to, we don't have Top Gun 2. But <laughs> we're going to, you know, maybe Ashton Kutcher will help make another movie for us. That would help. There you go. So you want that to would hear, definitely can, help. Hand me, hand me the Master Chief's notebook. <laughs> yeah, so I know in the back that'll be hard to see. This is a new, I want to also be clear what this is. <laughs> the, we are not supplanting the racing stripe, the shield, the iconic. This is a tertiary mark symbol that was developed to resonate with 18 to 22 year olds. In fact, even I was like, eh, I don't like it. I don't, and then. <laughs> Looks a little bit like the post office eagle. I'm past all that. It's good. I love it. <laughs> I have a sticker. <laughs> but so, you know, make, get, um, for those of you that are out and engaged with communities, I mean, the, these, we, we do have uh, some of this new brand and mark out, and it is meant uh, to be targeted towards that, that group that we are recruiting. Also, and at the bottom of this, it says protect, defend, save. Like this is right out of the updated uh, ethos and also is meant uh, to resonate with a broader portion of the workforce. The workforce is debating why save isn't first and defend versus protect. It, 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 this is intended on kind of uh, becoming more sort of modern and intentional with, uh, with some of that look and some of, the, uh, some, some of the branding. Very good, very good. All right. Each director of auxiliary reports to their district chief of prevention which creates 16 different approaches as to how the auxiliary is managed. Would the auxiliary not be better served if each director of auxiliary reported to a chief director, to the chief director? Huh. I think we stumped her. No, right, so again, much, much like the, the financial question, this question on sort of command and control, if you will, lines of authority probably were, so, one of the things that I have challenged the organization to do, and it, I think it applies in this instance, anytime somebody says to me, we've always done it that way. Oh, yeah. Right, that is a complete red flag. Because just because it served us for the last 233 years this August doesn't mean it still serves us well. So when I talk about some of the workforce assumptions that we're unpacking, because the way we're doing it now does not resonate for the way we need to do it in the future. We have grown and matured as an organization. The operating risk that we are all operating in, you as well as us, has changed, and we should be openly questioning how, we've, how we're moving money, whether we've got policy that still serves us well and is kept up with the current um, you know, current risk profile and operations and whether we've got the right reporting chains. I mean, we, we, it's our organization. In most cases, we are only limited by policy. It is for us to make it better so that it uh, is more 
uh, efficient for, for everyone contributing. Thank you. <laughs> With all that Coast Guard Auxiliary members are doing to augment and support the active duty Coast Guard during this extreme time of need, what resources can the Coast Guard provide to help the Coast Guard Auxiliary recruit new members? Obviously, if we, we can recruit additional members, we can provide additional support. Yeah, so the quite you know, recruiting is just, a, it, it's a challenge. I mean, many of you are in, you know, segments of industry and the workplace where everyone is struggling for a talent and we're in a bit of a competition for that talent. We certainly are competing against the other military services for that talent. Uh, we're competing against the likes of Amazon and Google and their big, big pocketbooks. I think my belief, and I think this applies to the auxiliary recruiting challenge as well, is that you know what we offer. It's a little bit like the um, what's the ad? It's the uh, it's a Mastercard. The, the you know priceless. This mm -hmm. is pri price. We offer yes. something. We offer something that's priceless. You're, we offer a sense of camaraderie, uh, some of service, uh, of commitment to something bigger than self. This, this, you know, money does matter. I'm not dismissing that, but, but the, it really is not something that you can put a price on. The ability to work along uh, somebody with shared values and commitment uh, to the nation, right? That we, and we don't tend to talk about that directly, but that is the value proposition of having the ability to put on a uniform, the cloth of the country, and, go, and, and serve the nation in a way that is in, inspiring. It's what, it, what's brought you here today, what brings you each and every day uh, into your uh, flotillas and the work is that sense of camaraderie and value proposition. And as we talk about bringing talent in, I think we need to do a better job of talking about that and why it's so, uh, so critical to serve, whether it's on the active duty side or the auxiliary side, to serve the nation, because the democracy depends on it. I will add on this topic in the vein of she can get me out of more trouble and I can get her out of again. Um, so, and I, 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 I talk whether I'm talking to a, to a group of civilians or to a, to a group of, of, of Coast Guard folks, one thing we have to acknowledge, well, first of all, no matter where we go, if, we, if we're visiting shipyards, um, we were at Transcom today, no matter where we go, any industry we hear right now, people are struggling for employees, period. I kind of wonder what the heck are people doing to employ themselves now because it, it seems like nobody's out there working. But one thing I will say that, that a unique challenge that we have that our, our, our sisters and brothers in the DOD have, um, that our police and firefighters have is, and, and I'll just say it, there is a negative narrative in our country today about uniform service. There is a negative narr narrative about it and we need to change that. We need to make sure that we're, we're, we're bold enough to stand up and say it is a damn honorable profession to put on the uniform and go to work every single day. That's the one thing where I think collectively, and this isn't just for the Coast Guard, this is all of us that serve in uniform, need, need to be brave enough to help fight that national narrative. Very good point, thank you, very good point. All right, uh, in that same vein, uh, somebody said, I joined the auxiliary to re promote recreational boating safety, support the missions of the Coast Guard, actively support America's Waterway Watch, seek educational opportunities open to both auxiliarists and the, and the US Coast Guard. Given the personnel shortages and need for recruitment experienced by both active duty and auxiliary, what are your three to five top skill sets or qualities when seeking people to join the Coast Guard? Sounds like just serving the workforce, serving, serving any capacity. And, and my, my top requirement is I just need you to meet the requirements and put a uniform on, really. Um, so we have not changed the standards. So and I should let me talk a little bit more about kind of the reality of where we are with recruiting. So first off, we have not, so the, the medical, uh, we're, we've made some changes on the medical side, aligned ourselves more closely uh, with DOD. Uh, so not only is the pool of people with a propensity to serve shrinking, the pool of medically qualified people is shrinking. Where we've got one pilot 
class, a 10-week class going on right now. Normally it's eight weeks at KMA, we have a 10-week class. You've seen the uh, Navy and Army both move to sort of pre-boot camp, boot camp, in other words, ex increase eligibility, get people fit and over some of the uh, hurdles that they're, they're facing to, uh, to serving. I believe in time we are going to need to continue to unpack some of the medical requirements. We're not there yet, but I think it is coming for us. Um, and uh, so at Cape May, a full class is 125. The class we graduated last month was 45. So we haven't filled a bus. We have not had a full bus into Cape May in two plus years. All right, so that's how acute the recruiting challenge challenge is. Um, so again, the standards the standards are there. They are important, but but again, as we look at uh, assumptions that have served us well, may not serve us well as we look at attracting talent uh, from the next uh, generation. So here's a, hy a hypothetical. It's worth uh, worth thinking about. I talked about the cyber protection teams. Uh, you know, the cyber, uh, thankfully there are people that love this kind of work, you know, they're in a dark room and they're on a keyboard and, you know, they, you, you hand them a cup of coffee or you toss them a slice of pizza, they don't want to talk to you. They're just in there, right, on the, doing what, whatever you do on the cyber front. But do you need to be, do you need to be fully able-bodied to do that work? Can you be in a wheelchair? You know, what, what level of, right, so the, there are some logical kind of extensions as the nature of our, and we still need physically fit, uh, you know, people, we need them on our ships, the Army needs them on the front lines, but there are other segments that we, we might uh, need to unpack some of those, some of the rigidity around the physical requirements. Color blindness. I don't want you running one of my Coast Guard ships colorblind, but there's a lot of work you can do in the Coast Guard with, with color blindness. Um, ADHD medication is a big one right now as a disqualifier. Again, this, we're, we're recruiting from the generation we have, and uh, we, we should be driving to qualify, not disqualify. And so there's some, there's some work that's gonna need to be done uh, around, uh, around that. At the end of the day, so while we don't have the numbers coming into Cape May that we need to have coming into Cape May, the kids that are coming are unbelievable. They're smart, they're driven, they're focused. They know exactly why they've joined the Coast Guard. They know what the value proposition is and they can't wait to get to the fleet. Same thing at the Coast Guard Academy. So we are, the talent that we're bringing in is exceptional. We just need to increase the, the numbers, numbers and throughput. Very good, very good. All right, one more question here. So that we can start development programs now in anticipation of future needs, what type of roles do, do you need, do, um, do you see the auxiliary augmenting over the next two to five years? So, I, you know, I think that's part of the intent of the, the gap analysis, barrier analysis, right, is what, in you know, working together to identify where those, uh, where those areas might be. I think like the Ox Chef program or you know culinary program. You know when I when I promoted to Admiral ten plus years ago, it was sort of it was around, but it was kind of in its infancy. Look at where it is today, with two cooks circumnavigating the United States on on Healy. Um, the the translators and linguists, the Ox Chaplain program, right? There was a time where I think you go back long enough, we'd had a couple of Ox Chaplains and then sort of backed away from it and then reinstituted the program. I can't imagine not having over 100 ox chaplains. The work that the doctors and dentists are doing for us. And so um, I would ask the collective group, you know, there's a ton of talent and life experience that sits out there uh, that um, we, we need to think, think about how we, how we internalize that and bring it in. And we are really only limited by our, by our imagination on what and, what and how we do that. I will echo uh, Master Chief's comments with regard just to life experience that you bring to the units that you're working with. I, there was a small group of you I met with earlier. Right? I, every time I see you guys, it's like, oh, good, we have adults in the room, not 20-year-olds, you know? <laughs> and I just, a couple things. So one thing that's so amazing, and we don't have a leadership council meeting where Gus sat and sitting at the table with us. And, no, and, and he sits there quietly most of the time listening, and as he hears us talk about something, he'll just get, kind of get a smirk and go, we can help you with that. And that's how, that's how these programs take and build. I mean, 
I'll throw something out there that, that I was actually going to talk to Gus about it in May, but I'm going to do it in front of the whole room right now. <laughs> is, uh, you know, um, you know as, as, as the commandant goes to the Hill and we're advocating for funds, you know, obviously shore infrastructure, we're, we're, we're getting better with the funding that we're getting, but we've, we're struggling with our inherent capacity to execute the funds. I guarantee you we have structural civil engineers in the Coast Guard Auxiliary somewhere. That, this, this is a, see, that's the answer we get right there. He smiles and goes, we got this. This is maybe an untapped capacity. These, these are the ways that we're just, we have to think differently about how we're employing the force. All right, with that. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. This was so awesome. Right. Thank you. No, Mrs. Barth, I don't. <laughs> In that case, thank you so much for. Oh, I'm sorry. So I think this is going to conclude the program, right? Let me. I just want to say thank you again. Uh, what a remarkable group of Americans, of volunteers uh, here in the room. Uh, again, I I thank you. I applaud you. I celebrate you for your volunteerism, your support, your leadership, your professionalism. Uh, I truly can't imagine where we would be uh, without you and what you are doing each and every day to make us not just the world's best Coast Guard, but the world's best military. Thank you. With that, everyone have a nice evening, and we'll see most of you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Thank you. No, I wasn't going to. <laughs>